Parsha 101, Parsha Spiracious. Much, much, much going on in this week's Torah portion. Lots of different commentaries. So much going on. It's so much commentary, 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 commentary about all that's going on. So we'll try to hit some key things, but definitely worth looking into more. So this is the first Torah portion of the Torah, of the five books of Moses. This is where the account of creation, the account of humanity begins from here. And the name of the Torah portion, Bereshis, comes from the first verse of the Torah portion. Bereshis, Bar Lukim, Es HaShemayim Besaretz. In the beginning, in the beginning of God's creation, God created the heaven and the earth. And it says that God looked into the Torah and he created the world. As in, well, the Torah is God's wisdom, etc. But part of what it is, that it, the Torah is the blueprint of creation. That all of, all of creation is contained within the Torah. Not that Torah has become part of the world, but the world is actually a part of Torah. And not just that, but the world itself was created for the fulfillment of Torah. That is the purpose of creation. In a way, as a general idea, we could see that it starts off, the Torah starts off with a general history of the earth, a general history of humanity. Not specifically with the Jewish people and not specifically with, with the commandment either. And part of what it is that God intended for all of humanity to be guardians and, and fulfillers of the Torah. But as we see through the history of humanity, it started off with Adam and Eve, Adam and Kava, and as the generations went on, many of the generations rejected this approach. And there was sort of like a role transference that occurred that because all of humanity were not, was not on board, there was a fa one family held on and that one family was selected. So from Adam, there were there were certain descendants who held on and that that those descendants would eventually become the Jewish people, the chosen people. And part of what we see here, even for the first verse that God created the heavens and the earth. It's not just, it's physical heaven, physical earth, but also the spiritual heaven, spirit and physical earth. So all of physicality and our spirituality, the blessings, existence, all of it comes from God. Interestingly enough, the creation of the earth is actually noted to be on the 25th day of Elul. And they say that, so six days later, we rush on us when man was created on Rosh Hashanah. That's what it says. And so the world's created now, time itself is created now, and God created God spoke and the world came into being, God also created language in this time. That God spoke because this is, it's words that form creation. Specifically, when we speak about what we would call Lush and Akodesh or Biblical Hebrew. This is, this speaks to the nature and the essence of things, which is why language, that's what language captures. So the Torah portion, the next verse goes on that the earth was void, there was darkness over the abyss, the spirit of Hashem hovered over it. God now said, let there be light. Now creation begins. First thing that we have is light, even though there's nothing has been created yet. And there's no there's no people, there's no one to appreciate light. And yet light was created first because this is the intent of creation. So before embarking on this massive project per se, also for God, it's not a massive project, but before embarking now on this project, God stated his goal from the outset, that the, the, the intent of this project, the purpose of everything was is to bring light into the world. So God sees the light, he says this light is good, and then he separated between the light and the dark. And then there was evening, there was morning, and now we have one day. And this is also part of it. There's evening and then morning, there's darkness and then there's light. This is the way the world works, bringing light into the darkness. And also, that light breaks through the darkness and the chaos. So there's darkness, there's a void, and then there's light, and the light can shine through the darkness. Of course, deep lessons there. Now the second day of creation, that's day one of creation. Day two of creation, God separated the waters, so we now have what's called Shamayim, Shamayim, that's the heavens. There is water above. Of course, it's kind of like an atmospheric kind of moisture, not waters, and then the waters below, which would become the ocean. It doesn't specifically say it was good here. All the days of creation says God saw it was good. It does not say the second day of creation, different reasons. And also because the third, it kind of wraps up, but the second day began. Also in the second day of creation, angels were created. Also, it says that uh, Gehenna Purgatory was created that day also. On the third day, God it says that God gathered the waters and he called them, this is going to be sea. And then he said that the dry land should come up and this is going to be earth. Because earth is really denser. It's more physical than water. So really, the whole world should be covered in water. But God moved the waters aside so that dry earth could, should come up. And that is now earth. And he said there should be, there should sprout forth vegetation, etc. So again, this culminates with the second day began, and that's why the, the third day of creation, God said it was good twice. Um, it says also that the, God told you know the trees that you should have fruit, that are gonna be delicious fruits and things like that. If originally, the bark of the tree was supposed to taste like the fruit. And uh, that didn't, the trees didn't exactly do what they were supposed to be doing. 
But that was also, it says that Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, was created on this day. The fourth day, it says that God placed the luminaries in the sky. And these would be signs, they would be for signs and for the festivals, the days and the years, right? That we would use the sun, moon, stars, planets, etc. They're all placed in the sky, but especially the sun and the moon would be there so we could tell time with them. And that they're originally the first day, there was just this light that was just not specifically coming from anywhere. But now that we have these luminaries, the light would be coming from them. And originally the sun and the moon were the same brightness and they served at the same time. The moon complained. It's like, you don't need both of us. So God dimmed the moon. And then he said, okay, now you're going to go in the night sky. And because you're dimmer, the light, the stars will be able to shine out at night. And there's different things, but commentaries say that event, that messianic times, the moon will return to its original brightness. The fifth day of creation, the creatures of the sea, the fowl, as in the birds, fish, amphibians, all those were created. It says the Leviathan, the Leviathan, the massive fish, was created that day. There's supposed to be a male and female because everything God created male and female, but God knew that if you had a male and female Leviathan and they would populate the earth, there'd be nothing left. There'd be nothing left in the ocean except these two massive fish. So the female Leviathan was put away for times of Mashiach. And God blessed this the, these birds, fish, amphibians, say you should be fruitful and we should multiply multiply prolifically, especially because the humans would come to eat them. They would have to make sure they'd be able to multiply quickly and very much. Now, the sixth day of creation, when the beasts of the earth were created, livestock, reptiles, each according to their species, again, men and women. And then at this point, God now says, let us make man in our image. Even though God was the one who created everything, it says officially he was speaking to the angels, who originally were not on board of the creation of man. And what it means that let's make man in our image, we're going to create men to be upright, not to walk on all fours like an animal, be upright, they'll have intellect and discernment, right? What separates the human beings is that they could have a moral code, they could actually differentiate between good and evil, not just pain and pleasure, like animals can, etc. Now, if they will live up to their image, God says, then they're going to rule over the earth and all the creatures. Animals will fear them, etc. If they don't, however, then it, uh, it's not going to be so great for them. Now, man specifically, God did not speak and man came into being, but God created man. It says, from the depths of the earth, etc. Here it says, this is actually going to go back and forth about the creation of man, and then it gets... It, the Torah portion tells about other things. It goes back to the creation of man and other things, creation of woman. The earth speaks uh, specifically. It says male and female, he created them. And a lot of commentaries say that man was a, man, male and female were originally created back to back. It's kind of like this one super, super human kind of entity, which would eventually become separated to be an actual male and a female. God blessed them. He said, you should be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and become master of the earth. This is the first command that is given to, to human beings is to is to be fruitful and multiply. And it says, you know, if you do so, you're going to be master of the earth. You're going to have the plant and the trees are going to be food for you. These plants and trees are also going to feed the birds and etc. The allowance for eating. If an animal died, they were fish allowed to eat it. But for specifically shechting an animal to eat, that only came after the flood. Now, there's other ways that being fruitful and multiply is, is being like God, as in, in a sense... It's, it's imaging, it's a mirroring God in the sense that it's bringing creation, bringing new life into the world. And there are ways that that can happen in a spiritual sense by teaching others good morals and values, etc. It says also that on the 60th creation, the demons were created on this day. Now at this point, God sees everything that has been created and he says that it's very good. Because now that there is humanity in the world, now the purpose of creation can be fulfilled. Then it says on the seventh day, God completed all he had set out to do. And what does God do on the seventh day? He rests, which now completes the cycle, shows what a complete week is supposed to look like with work, 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 and then rest. And it also says that God worked until the last minute, until it's the final shot, God worked, work, 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 because a lesson to us that we should have no empty moments in our life, that we should fill uh, fruitfully, productively. And then God bless and sanctifies the seventh day. And somewhere around here is where the verses of Kiddush come from. Then it goes, the Torah portion goes and says, these are the chronicles of heaven and earth. And it's going to start, it goes back again to specifically speak more about the creation of man that God gathered from all the earth, from all different places. Because when the earth came up from the waters on the third day of creation, also the different geographical regions were created. So that they could have different uh, characteristics to the different geographical re regions. So it says that God gathered, or he got, gathered earth from all the different regions because man, no matter where it would be, he was going to, you know, from dust you come, from dust you return. And so, gathering yeah, from all the regions kind of allowed that man could be anywhere in the world, could then be buried and go back to the ground where he came from. And then, 
there's this idea that a lot of the vegetation was actually growing underground. There was no rain specifically for it to burst forth yet. But once man was created and man was created to work, etc., man could pray for rain. And then all the vegetation burst out. And, uh, and, now, the, and now we have uh, the completion of all the things. It says the mist rose up from the ground, etc. It says God formed Adam. He formed the man from the dust of the earth. And then he blew a soul into him. And now we have body and soul, which again speaks to what the purpose of creation is. Taken from the lowest of the elements, which is earth, and soul, which is highest of the elements, a part of God, the spiritual, and fusing them together. And this is what man's job is to do, is to bring the spirituality into the physicality. And then the word Adam, he says, man, he formed him. The word Adam comes from the word Adama, which is earth, but it also comes from the verse of Adama Le'alion, I will be similar to. To be similar to because man's purpose is to mirror god in the traits obviously the good traits that god portrays to learn to be like him to be upright it's a discernment etc then it says that god planted a garden for adam to live in which is also the garden of eden most commentaries agree that it started off as a physical place whether or not after everything that happened if it reverted to a spiritual place or if the physical place still exists is a matter of opinion but it definitely was a physical place this garden of eden where adam originally lived they say it was northeast of the land of Israel, somewhere along the Euphrates River. Wherever that is, of course, no one today would be able to find it, but God created the garden, he put in the tree of life, he put in the tree of knowledge. Many commentaries say that the tree of knowledge was a fi were figs. Um, it does, commentaries also say that the reason why it's never specified what kind of fruits were in the, were the tree of knowledge is because people know today, oh, this is the, these are the fruits that cause sin, then everyone would reject that fruit, right? So, we don't specifically know, but this is what a lot of, com there's different commentaries, this one they say. And they had all kinds of fruits that were in the, uh, in the garden, and fruit bearing trees, and a beautiful place to be. Man was created to, to cultivate it and guard it. So, there's an, there's an active and a passive purpose to creation, uh, active, passive approach to our work, and to, you know, actively doing what we're supposed to be doing, passively refraining from what we're not supposed to. But so you had all the trees and, and this beautiful garden and well, Rashi, a foremost commentator of the Torah, says that there were all different type, types of things there, but it was mainly an apple orchard, which that's his uh, take on it. And then it talks about how a river came out and from there, there were four rivers that came out of it. It describes the different rivers. Commentators talk about if one of them was the Nile River, the Euphrates, the Tigris, different rivers that it speaks about. And then God tells Adam, you can eat from any of the trees of the garden, but do not eat from the tree of knowledge, or that is, or you will die then. Then, then it goes through this whole thing, so kind of going back now, back to the creation of man, that it says that God brought all the animals before man, and as a man, as an Adam, and he named them all. So how can you name them all? Well, he has to be able to see what their essence is, what their nature is. And the Hebrew word, the Hebrew name he gave it, actually encapsulates the nature and the essence of the animal which goes back to God creating the world through speech and this whole idea of that. So Adam was able to see what the nature and the essence of the animal was and give it a fitting name in Lashon HaKodesh in, in, in this holy language of the holy Hebrew language, not just modern Hebrew, but the, the, the language of the Torah and give it the correct kind of name. And he sees that they're all coming male and female. They're all coming, they all have helpmates basically. And then he's looking around and said, I don't have one. Where's, I, need, I need one. And that's when it says, you know, God says, he sees that it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him as Ezer Konegdo. Ezer Konegdo mean a, help, a helpmate opposite him, which opposite him means that either they're going to, when they are in accord, then they work side by side. But when they disagree, then they actively work against each other. Um, so then Hashem put Adam into deep sleep. And that's when you can say he created uh, the female, the woman from the rib, or that he separated when the back to back, he separated that now male and female should be two separate entities. And this is going to be uh, the new law of nature that there is going to be man and there's going to be woman. And Adam, in, in line with him naming, he says he is Ish, Ish means a man, and he names the woman Isha because it comes from Ish, right? This is this is a woman, this is what it is. And the Torah states that this is now, this is now, now the law, this is now the nature of man, the law of man, that a man will leave his parents and cling to his wife etc. And then it also commentaries say that Adam and Chava, that man and woman were created as mature 20 year olds. So even on the first day, the first day there weren't babies, which also speaks to the rest of the world. If you want to know what came first, the chicken or the egg, well the chicken came first. God didn't create eggs, he created chickens. 
everything was created already in a mature state. Most things were created in a mature state. It would have taken many centuries for everything to have reached its fruition. So Adam was not created as a little baby, he's created what say 20, like a 20 year old mature um, adult and same with the woman at the same. Then it also notes that uh, that man and woman, they were walking around the garden, they were naked, but they felt no shame because the kind of spiritual level they were at, it was beyond kind of this, this a sort of kind of consciousness that we have in the material physical world today, which of course changed when everything went down. So now the whole story happens where the serpent, who is the most cunning of all creations, he sees Adam and Chava and they're doing their thing and they're hanging out with each other and they're close to each other and uh, et cetera, et cetera. He now, also, he wants Chava. He wants the woman for himself. So he's going to try to, he wants, what his whole plan was to try to get rid of Adam and then he would take Chava for himself. But of course the whole thing backfired. So he comes to Chava and he says, didn't Hashem say that you can't eat from any of the trees? And Chava says, no, we can eat from any of the trees. We're just, we're not allowed to eat touch or eat the tree of knowledge which she added that in touch was not what god had said god said don't eat from it so the serpent knows that the serpent pushes her against the tree and it's like look you touched it and you didn't die so of course if you could touch it you can't die and of course you can eat from it and you won't die god knows that if you're gonna eat from it then you're gonna become like him he doesn't want you to be like him right so he goes on and on and eventually of course he convinces her to eat from it and as soon as she eats from it she then goes and she convinces adam to eat from it and now, then this is the beginning of the end of everything. Now, all of a sudden, they realize this spiritual state they were in has now been, is, is now gone, and they have, are now entering into a lower state, this more physical, material reality, a little bit more akin to the world that we live in today. So, all of a sudden, they realize that they are, they're naked and they are ashamed now of their nakedness. They cover themselves up with fig leaves, and then they go to, to hide. The commentaries say, or like a Hasidic viewpoint, is that it says that Chava saw the tree was good. Right, that it was, oh, this is a good tree to eat from. And that started everything because a lot of people say like, oh, what's the big deal to just look, right? And I shouldn't be doing this. What's the big deal to look? So, because it's it's a slippery slope. Looking can lead to desire. You can create a desire. Desire can lead to action then. And then action could also lead to misleading others, bringing others along for it. So then they try to hide, of course. And Hashem, it says that Hashem's voice is now walking around the garden. Uh, part of commentary of that is that there was now a removal that occurred. God was much more present in the world before the, the sin occurred. And once the sin occurred, it's like God was one step removed now from the world than, than what he had been. So they hid and then God's famous line that God says is, Ayaka, where are you? He's trying to open up a conversation with Adam and Kava, give them a chance to say, oh, we totally messed up and we're so sorry for it, which is not what happened. The author Rabbi, the first Chabad Rabbi teaches that this word of Ayaka is not just uh, an opening to conversation, but it's something for everybody to think about each day of their life. We say, Ayaka, where are you? Where am I? Where am I in my life? What have I done? How far have I gone? What am I accomplishing? What am I doing? Take an assessment of ourselves. So God says, where are you? And he says, who told you? They say, oh, we're hiding because we realize that we're naked. Da, da, da. And that child says, who told you you're naked? As in, who told you? What was this eye-opening thing that you had? Right? He's giving them a chance to say what they did wrong. He's saying, how did you, you know, what happened between one minute and the next? So Adam says, this woman that you gave me, she tricked me. So instead of take accepting, he shifts the blame. He says to Chava, what happened? So the serpent deceived me. So they keep shifting the blame. Yes, on the one hand, they realize they did wrong, but at the same time, they're still shifting the blame. So, which is why God still is dealing with them pretty harshly. So God turns to the serpent and he says, you're going to be more cursed than any, any other animal. You're going to move around on your belly. You're no longer going to have, oh, originally the serpent had hands and feet and could talk. He says, I'm taking all that away from you now. Um, you're gonna eat dust for the rest of your life. This, these people that you went after, you, their offspring, your offspring are gonna hate each other. They're gonna grind your head into the ground, basically, and you're gonna try to bite their heel. This says to the woman, you're gonna have difficulties in pregnancy and in raising children. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna long for your husband. He's gonna dominate you, etc. And it says to Adam that the ground is cursed now, and you're gonna, it's gonna have to, you're gonna have to produce food from it with much difficulty, and you're gonna eat bread by the sweat of your brow and your death into dust shall return. Basically now, theoretically, they should have died the same day that they ate, but God did not, because they had partial remorse, um, God didn't allow them to, to still live, but they were now mortal, of course. They were not going to be immortal anymore. Now it goes back in the narrative, and it talks about when the woman was created. Adam gives her a name, the name of Chava, which comes from the name of Im Kochai, the mother of life. Then it says that Hashem 
made Adam and Chavi made them garments, and he sends them away. He sends them away definitely before they can eat from the tree of life, and because they eat from the tree of life, commentaries say they could have become like a deity. Like, oh look, they're doing whatever they want, and now they're going to be immortal. God can't allow that to happen. So he sends them away. He banishes them from the garden, and he places the angel with, revol- with the revolving sword before it, so no one can now enter the Garden of Eden. Now we shift. The story continues with the story of Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel, who were born before the banishment from the garden, which is part of the whole thing with the difficulty in pregnancy, because originally Chava was pregnant for a short amount of time, and delivery birth was very easy. But now, of course, things were going to change. But Cain and Hevel were born first. So. Cain, Cain becomes Cain, who's Cain, becomes a farmer, and he, he decides he's going to bring sacrifice to God, and he says, I'm going to bring from the best of what I've got, the best of the species, which was going to be flax seed that he was going to bring, because flax make linen, can make nice clothing, so I'm going to bring it to him, but he didn't necessarily, he was not necessarily protect about the quality of what he brought. He said, oh, I'm bringing the best species, that's fine, but it doesn't matter what I bring for the best species. Havel, Abel, his brother, was a shepherd, and he said, I'm going to bring the fattest of my sheep before God. So even though the sheep are not necessarily the most, the best of the species, they're not a bull, whatever, but I'm going to be the best of what I've got. So it was kind of, uh, is it better to bring a better species or better to bring the best of what I've got, even if it might be lesser? And of course, the answer was that God turned toward, toward Abel. He turned toward Hevel and his offering, and he rejects Cain's offering. And then Hashem turns to Cain and he says, you know, why are you so upset? If you improve, you're going to be forgiven. He's giving him a chance to come back, bring a new, different kind of offering now. He says, sin crouches at your door, but you can you can control it, you can dominate it, right? Just because you've got this this thing going on inside you now, you, you can you can rule over it, which is, of course, a lesson for all of us that it's not about the temptation or desire, it's about controlling it. And Cain, instead of bringing a new sacrifice, takes takes a lot of turn over here, and he says that there are words between Cain and Hevel. Cain and Abel had words, and Cain, right... He rises up and he kills Hevel. And then, sort of a similar thing to what happened with Adam and Chava, that Ayaka, where are you? God, oh, Cain, where'd your brother go? And the famous words, Cain says, am I your brother's keeper? And then God says, what have you done? Right? He's giving him now a chance to confess and repent, and he doesn't. Even though he is still ashamed, so there's sort of like the partial thing there, but he didn't totally fess up when he should have. And God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me. And you are now going to be cursed, and you're going to be a perpetual wanderer, right? Be able to kind of become like a nomad, kind of. And um, Cain says, is my, is my sin too great to bear? If anybody who sees me, they're going to kill me. So now what? There's no comeback from any of this, etc. So God says, vengeance is going to wait for seven generations, and I'm going to put a mark on your forehead so nobody knows to come up, to rise up against you. So Cain now becomes a wanderer, and the Torah portion now goes into Cain's descendants, and it talks about, so for example, he has a son and he becomes a city builder and he builds a city in honor of his son. And then it goes many, many grandsons later. Um, he has a grandson named Lemach. And it talks about Lemach had two wives because already at this point, we kind of skipped ahead here, but it's talking about the corruption that humanity w- would fall into. They'd have two wives. One wife was supposed to be the, show, the trophy wife and the other wife was for having children. So it's sort of this object, objectification that they start having of like, we're going to use one woman for this and we're going to use one woman for this, which is not what women were created for. Not like that. So, um, Lamacha says, Lamacha has a son whose name is Yuval, Yuval, and he used to play the harp and the flute. Commentaries say it was for idolatrous purposes. So this is how far humanity has fallen at this point. The almost seven generations later. And then we have Tuval Kayan, another son that he said he sharpened iron and copper, which commentary says to make weapons. So this is where humanity is at. So now we're at the year 130, the seventh generation. These two sons are now the seventh generation. Um, it also says that Tuval Kain had a sister named Nama, who, fun fact, would be the wife of Noah. So it says that Lemach was blind, and so he would go hunting. He would go with his son, Tuval Kain. And at this, this is now seven generations later. It's time for, Kain, for vengeance to come after Kain. And so the mark that God had placed upon him was removed. And so they see him and they're like, what is this? You know, what? So what kind of sees says, what is this? So then, you know, shoot, 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 kind of. So Lemach kills him. And then he realizes, oh, wait a minute. This is a person. Oh, my gosh, it's Kain. Revan. And then Lemach is so upset that he kills Tubal Kain also. So now two people are dead now because of it. And there's a whole story that happens after that, etc. Now we go move over. And in this year also, Shays, who's the third son of Adam and Chava, is born. And 
it goes now through his descendants that Shays had a son named named Enosh, and during that time, that is when humanity would descend into idolatry. And it was a slow descent that occurred. It wasn't just, oh, there's a God, and all of a sudden they're worshiping idols. It was like, there's a God. God created these great luminaries to assist him in, you know, in the world. And then the next generation was like, oh, these great luminaries deserve temples and sacrifices. Oh, da, 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 until these great luminaries are gods themselves. So it was a slow descent that occurred from believing in God into idolatry, which led up to many other things as well. But even during this time, there was always one line that always believed in God still, that who still held the tradition. So now it's going to go into the sense of Adam, again, starting with Shays and all those people. Adam lived for 930 years. It's a sound commentary said that Adam was supposed to live for a thousand years, but he gave 70 years to King David. He saw the generations that were to come. He saw a bright light that uh, went out very suddenly. He said, who souls it? So this is King David. Well, now King David, but he would he was going to die as a baby. And, and Adam gave him 70 years of his life. And King David lived for 70 years. So then it, it records all the years and all the ages of the descendants. And part of this is because we can trace exactly back to the first day of creation. We don't believe the world just was just here, that it just arbitrarily came to being, that it always existed. We can actually pinpoint a day and moment of creation and say, this is when everything started. This is when God created everything. And then it goes on, et cetera, et cetera, goes to the generations and we get to a son named Hanoch, who says Hanoch would walk in the with the way of God. And he had a son, Mr. Shalach, Methuselah, who lived for 969 years. He was the oldest person to ever live. And now we have, it counts through 10 generations from Adam until Noah, to Noah, and Noah, the name Noah, when he's born, says this one is going to bring us relief from all of our work. And what it means is that, that Noah invented the plow, which made farming much easier. And then it says that Noah didn't have children until he was 500. Different reasons for that. One is that if he would have had a bazillion children, he would have had to build like 300 arcs to save everybody. Or also, if we would have a bazillion children, maybe many those children could have become corrupt. So this way, God kind of pushed off his having children so they'd be young enough to not be culpable in case they took a left turn somewhere. And Noah's three sons are Shem, Cham, and Yafes. And then it talks about how humanity became corrupt, which was going to lead to the flooding. Um, they, were, okay, they were engaging in idolatry at this point. Big thing that they, they engaged in very permissive sexual behavior. Really not good stuff was going on there. And basically the world descended into dishonesty, corruption, larceny. These are now the precursors that God says, okay, I'm going to give them a chance. And nope, they blew it. It's time to, the world, we got to start over. We got to hit the reset button. So it says that God was very pained by this and he's ready to wipe out all of creation. But Noah found favor in God's eyes, which now sets us up for next week's Torah portion of Noah and the Flood.